So big bream fishing is not for everyone. They're slimy, they don't really fight, but a real specimen can be a great um, prospect for targeting, especially during the autumn months and into winter. There's two real types of bream fishing. You get, the, you get the lakes that hold a lot of bream that are in the range of sort of seven to 10 pounds, and then you get the low stock venues. And, and I'm really interested in those low stock venues where the fish are bigger, but there's not as many. Now, these bream actually start to behave differently. It goes down to the initial shoal of fish thins out, and you end up with a lot fewer fish, which means a lot less competition for food and that means that they get bigger. When you have waters with such fish like that, they can be really hard to catch. I mean, they can be really tricky. So when, when bream fin out in their shoals and there's only a few left and they do get huge, and when I mean big, I'm talking over 15 pounds, which is massive fish all the way up to, you know, even 20 pounds plus. So these fish are very, very tricky to catch and they actually take on slightly different behavior. I think, what happens is they kind of lose their shoal mates and then they end up on their own and they don't really know what to do. And um, on occasion, you can end up with just one big bream in the lake. And this has happened in quite a few venues. And that fish either ends up swimming around with the carp and even takes on some of the carp personalities and characteristics, such as feeding in the margins and, and hanging around with them. So low stop bream fishing is actually completely different to the lakes where there's numbers of fish, which usually top out at sort of 10, 11, 12 pounds. Um, bream fishing as well is, is one of those that when you hear about big bream, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Um, you have to make sure that those, that the fish that you're targeting is in the water that you're fishing, because it seems on every lake where there's big bream, every angler's caught a 17 plus pound fish. And that's just not the case. Bream in stature um, are huge in, in the way of surface area. They're huge for their actual weight. Um, they're not thick bodied like carp. So a 12 pound bream looks huge. They look a lot bigger than they are. And a lot of these go unweighed by people not targeting them and end up being 17, 18 pound plus. And I can tell you there's been, I mean, this isn't just occasionally, this happens all the time. Um, so really make sure that the fish that you wanna catch are in the lake that you're targeting and you have evidence and accurately weighed fish to back that up. So you're not wasting your time chasing ghosts. I'm just gonna walk you through uh, a campaign uh, that's been ongoing for over a year now. Um, Lawrence and myself have been, uh, been out bream fishing on a, a number of different venues uh, throughout the year. It's been really tough going. It's been one of those ones that we've sort of banked and then thought, let's put this together and make a nice compilation of some, uh, some bream fishing on different venues using different tactics rather than doing a, a single video on, on just one water in particular. Um, so it's been an interesting ride, to say the least. Fish through a few different seasons, doing sessions here and there. So there's a bit of autumn fishing, sort of like late summer fishing and, and some summer fishing as well. Uh, different tactics, different baits, different venues. So it's a great all round perspective on bream angling. You know, hopefully uh, you can pick something up from this. We started on a large gravel pit uh, that actually contained quite a good stamp of bream in it. Not huge numbers, but good enough. So, you know, a bit of bait um, was okay to put out, although I didn't go too mad with it. Um, on this particular lake, I'd actually caught some really good fish in, in previous years. So I was quite confident I was fishing the right areas, fishing the right tactics and the right bait. However, there was, a, there was a change during, during that season, there was, there was a change um, with, with the bream fishing and it slowed right up. Um, these bream just went missing and none, none popped up dead, but you know, even the carpers weren't picking them up and you know, alarm bells start to ring 
and, and worry sets in. Um, I spoke to another bream angler who had done a, a number of nights on there for only one bream um, and it was becoming quite worrying that you know the stocks had uh, depleted and or, I mean these bream were old, uh, let's face it they were old, warty, <laughs> you know, um, granddad sort of fish. Uh, they didn't have a lot left in them. So, you know, nothing lives forever. Um, we suspected that they may have died off. There was theories that, you know, the algae bloom had turned them off feeding because that's something I'm, um, you know, I, I'm quite confident they don't like feeding in algae. So that always puts me off fishing for bream. If you get any sort of bloom, when you're talking to the carp anglers that are fishing at such distance and they're not picking them up, and I mean, this water was tough for carp. So when they're picking up sort of, you know, five times more carp than they are bream, uh, you have to wonder what the stocks actually are like. So I put the time in, I put the effort in, and it was slow. It was really tough going. Um, it wasn't the best time of year to be fishing for them. I would have fished later, but wanted to get some, some bream fishing in during the summer. So it all, it all worked out in the end, to be fair. It was, um, it was tough, it was brutal, and I fished a number of different swims around the lake, targeting different areas, and uh, a quick move to another area of the lake on a, on a wind change, um, some, some, there was some low pressure that was moving in, you could kind of actually see the clouds. You could see, you know, the sort of, the, the dark um, weather coming in and pushing over, um, and it looked really good for a bite. The wind was picking up, everything looked bang on. Didn't expect anything until the night, because big bream are very nocturnal. Uh, again, in those pits where there's a number of them, they, you could get daytime bites quite regularly. Low stock, big pit, bream, nocturnal, very nocturnal. And it must have been out there for about two, three hours, and the rods, it was off. Ding, ding, ding. You know, typical bream bite, no run. No, no real take, just a ding, ding, ding. You know, that, that very unexciting bite that you get. But going over to the rod, bending into it, yeah, confirmed bream, big old slab, blah, 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 spit a few head shakes and then, you know, hung itself, gave up. <laughs> Reel me in, plastic bag style. Got the net out, put it underneath, but what a great feeling, you know, we caught one, targeting them. Uh, Lawrence and I had spent quite a few uh, sessions on that, uh, on that lake filming. It all paid off. We've got one of the big brain, really happy with the outcome. And although it wasn't the largest in the world, it was a big fish. As I mentioned before, the bream in this pit were old and uh, this, this fish was no exception. You could tell it was absolute, it was ancient. You know, it had barnacles over it, um, that dark color, the sheen, everything about it just spoke, this is an old fish. And uh, you know, bream in these, in these gravel pits, in these clear, um, good quality waters can live to over 20 years. So, you know, this, this fish had been in there a long time. Um, it, was, it was more than likely coming to the end of its life. Um, but what, what a lovely fish to catch, uh, a lovely fish to see and a great way to sort of end my time bring fishing on that water. So after that fish decided to uh, put the bream rods away for a bit, get onto some other species. And it wasn't until the following spring that we decided to, to get back on the bream and have a go on a lake up north, um, which was an interesting prospect. It had done quite a few nice bream. It was a different type of venue. As I mentioned earlier, this one had a lot more bream in it of a smaller stamp. Again, there have been claims of 17, 18 pounders, which just wasn't realistic. Um, and like I said, again, you have to take this with a pinch of salt, but I knew there had been some good fish caught to sort of 12 pound. So this lake is com in complete contrast to the other uh, big gravel pit that we was fishing. It was big, so it did, it was a fair lump of water. It was public, which gave a whole new uh, problem. Uh, to the fishing as it does, another obstacle to try and get around. But we had a look around the lake, uh, trying to figure out actually where to set up and fish. It wasn't going to be a big campaign like the other lake. This was going to be a two night job 
just trying to bag a couple of fish for the camera. The conditions were very strange. They were actually, they were actually quite good, but we, we had a big turn in the weather and we had a lot of rain that came down, um, heavy, heavy rain in fact, which was quite interesting to be out, out in, fishing in. And you know, it's probably good for, for the angling, you know, that bit of low pressure always helps stir the fish up and get them interested. Um, so we set up on this area where, in this area where the wind was just pushing in. Um, bream, follow the wind. If there's one big tip you could give to someone that wants to catch a bream, I would say is follow the wind. You want it blowing into you. You know, if it's a real heavy wind, you want that, you want your brolly flying away. That's, that's how into you that you should, you should have it, you know. Um, they follow the wind and that's exactly where we were, right on the end of it. So, because of the number of bream in this lake, I wasn't afraid to put a big bed of bait out. And that included uh, my usual pellet, hemp, boily, crushed boily. Um, and then I had a ground bait mix, which was a halibut mix with some uh, worm castings in there, which I always like to put when I'm fishing. It's a great attractant. Um, and then some additives as well, um, including molasses, which is probably one of the best bream additives you can get. I like to get the big five litre tubs that you get. I think it's for, they, they have it for the horses. The horses like to lick it. But, so I buy that stuff from uh, your sort of local pet shop and um, add that in because it's fantastic. It's very, very sweet and it sticks the bait together perfectly. So once everything's mixed up, you know, I got that bait out. And like I said, I wasn't scared to put quite a bit of bait out. And that's what I did. So tactics for this particular venue were very simple. I went with a tungsten loaded, that's a coated braid hook link, stripped off the end bit a few inches, done the knot, this knot, etc., onto a specimen hook. Just a bit of putty actually on that joint. That just helps get that hook home into the bottom lip and pins everything down on the bottom. Um, I fished these helicopter style on a on a, a lead core leader so that everything's pinned down all the way on the bottom perfectly. Follows the contours of the bottom nicely. Uh, to accompany this, I was using the distance cage feeders in 40 gram. They can hold a lot of bait and you can really get it out there accurately. Fishing started off slow. Um, it was one of those sort of bait and weight tactics. Waiting for those that big shoulder of broom to arrive and get their heads down and really start feeding. We had a few nice fish that night, but then the weather took a turn for the worst. I mean, the wind picked up, the rain came down, and it was savage. We decided at that point, as soon as it cleared, we, will, we would get out of there, get home, get some food and some sleep, and get planning for our next trip to try and catch one of these big green. The next venue is steeped in bream fishing history. Walthamstow Reservoirs doesn't really need an introduction. It's well known for its bream on a number of its waters. I was really excited about fishing there. I've done quite a bit of fishing there in the past. Um, I think my first session there was probably about 15 years ago and um, I love the place. It is in complete contrast to the first big pit we was fishing. It's public to a certain time. Um, it's extremely urban. There's a lot going on. You're basically in London. So all senses are up because everything's going on around you. You've got high rise buildings there. You've got Canary Wolf over there. You've got buses going past there, watching you do your, your distance sticks and casting. So the last thing you want to do is you stuff a cast in the margins because you, you've got 30 people on a bus watching you. <laughs> so they'll, they'll all be laughing as they go past. You also get, I think particularly on a Friday or Saturday night, you can get the odd Larry person walking past. Uh, that's, that's had a good one down the pub and um, it can get a bit Larry at times, but you know, you're locked in. 
it's a completely different environment. I think it's fantastic, you know, urban sort of fishing. Um, and it's amazing that these creatures are in that water. You, you always think of, of fishing and nature being in rural areas. You think of lovely like, fields and sheep. But the reality is, these pits support a massive amount of wildlife and massive fish. And they are smack bang in London. Um, I think it's brilliant. Um, I love the atmosphere there and uh, I love fishing it. And I couldn't wait to get started on this next adventure. So with Wolverhamstow, I decided to change my tactics completely. Um, I actually went with slightly heavier rods because the amount of carp that are in this water, it was kind of inevitable that we were gonna pick them up. So I went with um, sort of two 7.5s um, using heavy leads again. So it's suitable for that venue. I actually went this time with fluorocarbon hook links down to a size eight hook. Now, what I decided to do was go with the Magalina rig, red maggot, and simply just thread on a maggot onto the fluorocarbon via the loop at the bottom, and then slide that onto the shank of the hook. And that actually creates quite an aggressive turn. Now that turn's really important to nail the fish in the bottom lip. It's brilliant for hooking mechanics. Um, it's teared waters apart in the carp scene and bream feed very similar. Um, it's a fantastic rig for bream. Once I've, once I've got the maggot in place, the fake, the fake maggot in place, I just put a few real maggots actually on the hook itself and then put a big bag of maggots on that, big PVA mesh bag of red maggot. Um, I do warn you, <laughs> be careful when you do this because you pinch one of the maggots with the hook and that's your bag gone because before you know it, the juice has come out of the maggot, it's dissolved, it's all over your bed chair and it's chaos. So be very careful when you're actually doing it because I've done it a few times and it's, and it's not nice. And let's be honest, maggots, they're not cheap. I was fishing, I mean, the, the lake that we were fishing, there's no massive features in it. It's quite sort of straight down to sort of eight foot at the time. I mean, it was a bit low uh, this time of year and with, you know, we haven't had a lot of rain, so it's quite low, but you know, it's pretty uniform bottom and it was just a case of really sort of getting, getting a distance and, and sort of baiting that area up with maggot, ground bait with some hemp molasses and some dead maggot in there as well, which I always do. It's just got that visual, they don't dig into the silt, which is what the bottom was like, just slightly silty. I set up on a bank that was probably not the most comfortable bank to fish <laughs> for reasons I've mentioned earlier, but I'm there to catch fish. So, you know, I'm not there for comfort and the wind was blowing in there. So that's where I decided to go. Baited up uh, nice and heavily because there's a lot of bream in there. But not too many particles, but you know, quite a bit of maggot out there. I, I bought a fair bit of maggot with me. And I mean, I was shattered actually. That first day I was absolutely knackered. Um, it had been a really long day. Um, I'd had a chat with Lawrence and that we'd been sitting there with a cup of tea, rods were out and I fell asleep, as you do. And I've had an absolute screamer on my left hand rod. And I've hooked into a fish that I could not stop. I mean, this fish just went. And I've caught a few big carp in my time, but this thing was, you know, it was, it was one of those proper big urns where it was slow and steady, you know, no quick runs. And it was just like a train, I couldn't stop it. I must have been playing it for eight minutes. It took me right round to the left of this corner I could feel grating on the on the, some branches and then gone. So I lost that carp, which I was gutted about because I'd set up not to lose carp. But you know, that's the, these things happen in fishing. The way it went around the, the, the branches of tree, I, I couldn't do nothing with it. But so that was a bit frustrating anyway. But I got that rod straight back out on the spot, and um, I actually then reeled in the others, clipped them up, reeled in the other two sorting out another maggot rig. Funnily enough, actually, the maggots on that hook had actually been sort of sucked away by small fish. So I quickly got some new maggots on that, got new bags on them, got them straight back out, hitting the clip, making sure I'm completely lined up with my far marker, which was like a pylon in the, in the distance. You could see the silhouette of, because this was about 11 o'clock. And then half an hour later, I got the bite that I wanted. I got that sort of uninteresting doo 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 do, 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 like that, which is interesting when you know there could be a big bream on it, 
but it's not exactly standout exciting when it actually happens. But out the bed chair, then in, yes, this is what we're after, sort of just a, just a dead weight. <laughs> so I still play them carefully because, you know, although they don't do a lot, just one head shake and you can lose fish of a lifetime still. So, you know, there's, there's no time to sort of um, relax and not actually concentrate. You're fishing, you're fishing for rare fish, big specimen fish. Make the most of it, concentrate. That's what I did, played it, came up, you know, like that. Paper bag, straight, straight underneath, looked down, and it was a huge bream. So, off the mark, first night, massive bream in the net, and a beautiful fish as well. I mean, really lovely colours on it. Now, there had been a bit of an algae bloom building up in the margins, and we were very conscious that, you know, the oxygen levels would be quite low in that particular, in that particular area. So, we had the fish in the net, and, you know, there was no, we, we weren't gonna retain it. So, we got the camera stuff out really quickly, got the fish out and did some nighttime shots, some pictures and then got it back. What a great fish to start on. You know, really, really pleased to have caught it so early on. It's usually the, the old two night trick with bream where you bait up on the first night and then they arrive and, and they feed heavily the second night, but, but that didn't happen. So following that fish, got the rods back out. Um, I think that was the key actually, sort of regular casting in a way to keep those maggots fresh on that hook for when those bream were there and arrive. And then all of a sudden, middle rod. Do, do, do. Do -do. out again another one brilliant they've arrived they're here they're feeding heavily fantastic and i played it and netted it and it got caught well it actually kited and went under my right hand rod and that started to beep and go so you know what you do you take it off the rest and then you just put it down on the floor and then i played it and then once we had netted the bream and I grabbed that rod and sort of went underneath so it was untangled, but just put it back down on the floor. We had a look at the bream in the net. Thought, that's even bigger than the last one. You know, it was an absolute lump, this thing. It was, it, was a, it was what we were after. You know, it's what I've pretty much been after all season. You know, it's not going to break any records, but it's a specimen, a brilliant fish, lovely, beautiful fish. Looking at this fish, and then I just heard a ticking. And it's like tick, 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 tick. And I'm thinking, what's this? And I looked at Lawrence, like, and he's like, that's just a rod. But I've got two rods, and they're not on the, they're not on the, the bite lines because I've just literally like done like that, so we could untangle that fish in a way. We're not untangle it, we just go around it. And I had to get my head torch and look to see which one was going. So I'm like peering down, going, what, what one is it? I mean, it's, remember, it's not running, it's not peeling off like a car. It's just a broom, like go like that. So I'm trying to figure out which one it is. <laughs> I see, and then all of a sudden I just see one of them just, just you know, the, the spool spin a bit. I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, it's that one then. <laughs> so I picked it up and uh, I was in again. Put that one in, brace, brilliant. So we had a brace of huge bream um, on that night and it kind of made all of these trips, they all came together in that final trip on that final venue and and we had some fantastic bream fishing and and that that's that's what we was after and it was a great end to the campaign so all in all it was a great adventure uh, we fished a number of different tactics different venues and three different counties for these bream and it ended with some fantastic fish <laughs>